Good morning. Listen to the words of the psalmist. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to sing together in our first hymn this morning, number 236. This great hymn by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, by gracious powers so wonderfully sheltered and confidently waiting, come what may, we know that God is with us night and morning and never fails to meet us each new day. As we sit, we join our hearts together in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Lord, how thankful we are 
that we know you are with us night and morning, never failing to meet us each new day. And how glad we are together in your presence together this Lord's Day morning, that in this time of quiet, turning away from the noise, the busyness of our lives, that our ears may indeed be open to you and our hearts reminded of the wonderful fellowship that we share with heaven itself and indeed with all the people of heaven this world over. How we thank you, O oh God our Father, that you open the doors of welcome to your eternal dwelling, to such as we are, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our great Savior, so that we can know through all the uncertainties, all the change of this passing life under the sun, in these mortal bodies which will fade and will fail, so that we can know with real certainty that our lives are not in vain, because they are hidden with Christ for all eternity that they are even now being kept by your gracious power, kept for the day of his glory, kept for the day of the unveiling of the great renewal, not only of ourselves, but of all this whole world forever in the glory of his presence. And so, oh God, the protector of all that trust in thee, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us thy mercy, that thou being our ruler and guide, we may pass through things temporal, that we may finally lose not the things eternal. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our Lord. Amen. A warm welcome to you this morning. Indeed, it is a warm welcome on this lovely day. It's good to see you. And uh, on this holiday weekend, when many of our folks are away, if you're here visiting with us and uh, you're on holiday, then very welcome indeed. I hope you'll feel at home with us. And uh, we'll have an opportunity after the service to greet you. You, you have one of these uh, sheets, I think, on your seats uh, or uh, given to you when you came in. On the front there, it tells you about our different services today still to take place. Do come back and join us this evening here at 6.30. English upstairs here and uh, Farsi downstairs. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. On the inside, you'll see um, various details uh, about today. And on the right-hand side, uh, what's going on this week. Please notice on Wednesday this week, there is uh, no uh, prayer meeting or uh, home groups. We were due to be having our annual congregational meeting, but that's been postponed to next Wednesday, uh, so it uh, won't be uh, meeting this Wednesday, you've got an evening off uh, to enjoy the sunshine. But uh, please come next Wednesday, a week on Wednesday, the 6th of June, uh, for that opportunity for us together to look over the year past and give thanks to God and uh, to look to the future and to commit it into his hands. Just finally then on the back page, you'll see next Sunday, uh, we're uh, welcoming Simon Manchester to our morning services as a guest preacher. Simon's been here uh, speaking at the Keswick in Ayrshire Convention this week and uh, he's got a week's holiday next week and then he'll be with us the following Sunday and uh, for our Servants of the Word Pastors Conference uh, as well. So uh, we look forward to him next Sunday morning. Also there you'll see this afternoon at five um, there's a membership class. Do come along here uh, before the evening service if you'd like to know more about what it means to be a, a member in the congregation here. Uh, you've been with us for a while and you'd like to explore that. We'd love to uh, speak to you a little about that uh, this evening. Well, I'll leave you to uh, peruse the rest of these notices, to use these sheets to remind you of all that's going on for your prayers in this coming week. And uh, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading uh, this morning, which you'll find in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. Um, we're looking at chapter 8 and 9. It's page 557 if you have one of the uh, church Visitors Bibles, a little time ago we had a, a brief series on some of the wisdom books of the Bible. We spent a week looking at the, the message of this book as a whole, but uh, last week and this week and then one more time, we're just delving in in a little more detail to some parts of this uh, very informative, very important book 
And last week we read the first half of chapter 8 down to uh, verse 15. It belongs with this next section. It's all tied together by chapter 8 verse 1, which is all about faces and uh, what our faces reveal about us. A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed. Well, what is that wisdom? What are the things we need to learn? Began to look at that last week. We're going to pick up at chapter 8, verse 16. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, neither neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all. How the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hands of God. Whether it's love or hate, man doesn't know. Both are before him. It's the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil, an enigma in all that is done under the sun, that the same events happen to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate, their envy, have already perished, and forever they have no more share, no more reward in all that is done under the sun. So go, eat your bread in joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has approved already what you do. Let your garments always be white, and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. Because that is your portion, your reward in life, and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, in the grave, to which you are going. <coughs> Amen. May God bless to us his word. We're going to sing now hymn number 209 which I think is a remarkable hymn that in many ways really picks up and summarizes so much of the message of this book of Ecclesiastes. It's about our joys and delights in life. And yet, verse 3, I thank you even more that all our joy is touched with pain, that shadows fall on brightest hours, that thorns remain, so that earth's joys may be our guide to something more. And not our chain, as though this was all there was. Let's sing this hymn and digest carefully its words, which are indeed very, very revealing. Number 209. <laughs>
as the musicians play now quietly, our offerings will be received. You might like just to meditate on these words of that hymn, which, as I said, do so profoundly, I think, capture the message of this book of Ecclesiastes. But as they do that in a quiet, our offerings are received. together. Our Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for the many joys and splendors that you have made to abound in this world. And yet, we also do want to thank you that though there is pain, though there are shadows that fall upon us, even in the midst of these joys, that these things are pointers to us, reminders to us, signposts to us, that the best you have kept in store, that we should rightly continue to yearn for all that you have laid before us in your sure and certain hope. And how thankful, Lord, we are that that is the case that we are constantly reminded, even by the dark things in life, that this veil of tears is not all there is, because were that not so, we would be overcome with despair and with hopelessness, with such sadness at so many of the things that we do witness in our lives, such as today, as we cannot avoid in all the news headlines Pictures of jubilant, rejoicing crowds, rejoicing over a referendum in Ireland whose impact will be to forfeit the lives of countless unborn babies, the most helpless beings in our human world. And people are having parties, rejoicing and celebrating as though some great good thing had been achieved. And likewise, Lord, our world is full of so many shadows of darkness, so many evidences of the confusion, the madness that is in the hearts of man all the days of his life here under the sun. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have shown us that our lives here, although they are richly blessed, cannot and will not ever obtain the peace that they seek until they rest face to face with our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to reign, to remake this broken world, to remake our broken bodies and hearts and minds in his image of beauty, of wholeness, of true humanity, of true and abiding love. 
So, Lord, we look out upon our world with all its confusions, all its distresses, all its disorder, all its darkness. And we cry to you, have mercy. Have mercy and shine the light of the glorious hope that is found alone in Jesus Christ, your Son. Shine it widely and deeply and urgently across the face of this earth. Strengthen your church, O God, our Father, with the true gospel of redeeming love, costly love, the love that brought you to the cross that we might be saved, but the love that demands from everyone who would follow to that glory the same self-giving, sacrificial love, the same humble submission to your hand, to your rule, to living under your gracious kingship as the only way and the only road to life. Lord, may that gospel tear away from human hearts, men and women and boys and girls across the world, across our nation, across our beloved city here, among our friends and family and loved ones. Tear away the hardness that has so encased so many hearts and cause them to refuse your truth and light. Have mercy, O great and mighty one, have mercy, and may your truth yet liberate and bring to life many who are now walking in darkness. So, Heavenly Father, we pray for our own hearts and our own lives here this morning. We would be those who not only see your truth, but live it. That our hearts may cause our faces to shine with the true joy of Christian hope to be way markers and signposts to our world of that way everlasting, of that way of joy in life and hope with certainty for life that is unending, for life in all its fullness, for life as you have created it and redeemed it to be life in your presence with glory and joy forever and ever. So come to us, Lord, this morning, we pray to turn our hearts back. For so easily and so quickly we drift away from your light and truth. Come to us, we pray, through your word and bless us in your presence. For we ask it in Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. As we come to God's word, then we sing together number 557 in our blue books. Lord, I have made your word my choice, my lasting heritage. Here shall my heart and mind rejoice upon my pilgrimage. Number 557.
turn, if you would, to uh, our passage there in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapters 8 and 9, page 557, I think it was, in the, uh, in the Visitor's Bibles. These two uh, chapters of Ecclesiastes are all about faces that tell a story. I quoted you last time something Charles Dickens said. Here's Oscar Wilde. A man's face, he says, is his autobiography. Then, uh, then he added, a woman's face is her work of fiction. Now, uh, so many ladies in the congregation, I dare not go any further with that one. So let's stick with autobiographies. What story does our face tell? There are many people, including sadly many Christians, for whom life's perplexities and pains have caused their hearts to be bitter, to be resentful, and to be hardened. The many and manifest injustices in this sinful world. And the refrain of their life has become this. It's so unfair. It's so unfair. And of course, much in life is so unfair. But they can't come to terms with it. And their faces show it. They have hard faces. And they're unhappy Christians. And therefore, unfruitful Christians. And they're radiant in their faces, not gracious forbearance, but griping frustration. And yet, of course, there are other believers whose lives have been tinged with just as much hardship and disappointment and pain and great injustice, perhaps, but their faces tell a quite, quite different story. Verse 1 of chapter 8 here is absolutely true of them in spades. Wisdom has made their faces shine, and there is no hardness visible at all. Because they have learned the message that the Apostle James writes about in his first letter. When he says to Christians, count it all joy when you meet all manner of trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And they've done what he said. They've let steadfastness have its full effect in them. So that they might be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. They've come to terms, in other words, with mortal life as it really is in this fallen world, even for Christian believers, even for those who have the knowledge of the true and living God, and even for those who walk in faith truly in Jesus Christ. They've come to terms with reality. But it's not an easy thing to come to terms with, is it? Because Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many Christians who are dissatisfied with life and who do have hardened faces, joyless faces. But friends, let me tell you, if you don't come to terms with this biblical reality, if you try and hide from it in some sort of fantasy Christianity that pretends that everything will be fine in your life as long as you do the right things, as long as you sing the right songs, as long as you pray the right prayers, as long as you go to the right churches, then one day that fantasy is going to collapse underneath an avalanche of real, realism. And some real crisis comes into your life that you just can't pretend away anymore. Now, it's far, far better to learn that reality now, the truth about real biblical faith and trust. Because that is the only way to strength. In fact, it's the only way to survival as a Christian believer. And... And it's the only way to real joy in life as well. The wise believer, chapter 8, verse 1, the one who knows the true interpretation of things, the one who has grasped the truth of the biblical gospel, is one who sees and knows just how vast and pervasive the tragedy of human sin really is. And therefore just how colossal a disaster is that man has brought upon this world. And God's curse upon these things. And he knows it's not something that can be put right easily just by pious words or prayers. Or indeed by flamboyant sentimental words of the, about the supposed power of romantic love no matter how enthusiastically those words are spoken at a royal wedding. 
No, the wise believer knows the truth. That the real answer will come to this world only through its recreation in glory. When at last it is, as the Apostle Paul says, freed from its bondage to decay and obtains the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When human beings are recreated. When the Lord Jesus comes. Nothing less than that can ever, ever put right the manifest injustices of our sinful world. Nothing else can put right the sheer mess of human sinfulness. Certainly not some supposed redemptive power of human romantic love. And the wise believer accepts that. And so the wise believer with the Apostle Paul waits patiently in hope for that great day. But he lives also with patient joy even amidst the mess of that sinfulness because that hope is real and certain because that hope will never disappoint because he knows the whole story. Not just is he realistic about the present reality. And that's what the preacher is pointing us to here as well. We saw that last time in chapter 8 verses 12 and 13 when it seems that the wicked seem to prosper now. Yes, they do, but it's not the whole story. Ultimately, it will be well, he says, for those who fear God, but not so for the wicked, because they do not fear God. They will not prolong their days into ultimate life. So we must see with that true perspective with that sight that comes from heaven, that sight that comes from above the sun. That's the preacher's constant message through this book. This world is unjust and unfair. Verse 14, look, good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. And that's vanity, that's an enigma, it's a puzzle, it vexes us. And it always will do under the sun in this human mortal life. But it's not the whole story. God's justice is a future certainty. And when we remember that, and indeed only if we remember that, can we be liberated, not, not only for endurance through this life, but for joy, even amid the mess of this fallen world. Hence verse 15 there, as we saw last time, I commend joy, to be joyful through all the days of our lives on earth under the sun. Now that is not shallow happiness, that's not pretending away life's bitter realities. No, that is the deep happiness of the contented spirit that's learned to live with patient joy amid all the mess of man's sinfulness because of a sure and certain hope in God's grace. But there's more even, more to living with contentment and joy than just a realistic view of this sinful world awaiting its final redemption. There's another big thing that can cause anger and resentment, and especially to Christian believers. And if we don't come to terms with it, that also will rob us of our joy and our contentment in life. And it's the fact that we know as Christians that behind all man's sinfulness, behind all the injustice in the world, behind all of these things, we know that ultimately there is the hand of God himself. We know, don't we, that God is sovereign, that he rules over all things. And that means, doesn't it, that so often when we are angry and resentful about the world, about its injustice, about its unfairness, deep down... We are often angry and resentful at God himself, aren't we? And that's very serious. And you see, verses 16 of chapter 8 through to chapter 9, verse 10 that we read, in these verses, the preacher is putting his spotlight exactly there to pinpoint this issue. Because we must live, uh, learn to live not only patiently with the tragedy of sin, but we must also learn to live humbly with the transcendence of God. And he is urging us in these verses to live with humble joy with the mystery of God's sovereignty. See, real wisdom, the, the wisdom that will make us shining-faced believers, it accepts not only are we not good, which is why the world is in a mess, but also we are not God. 
And it accepts, therefore, the, the limitations of our creatureliness. And that even for believers, even for Christians, there are and always will be mysteries that are utterly beyond us. It'll never be otherwise under the sun in this human life of ours. And so the preacher is telling us that the only way to joy in life, the only way to the real shining-faced faith, is to live not just with the mess of man's sinfulness, but also with the mystery of God's sovereignty. Look at verses 16 and 17 of chapter 8. They make it so plain, don't they? The workings of, the, of God in this world are simply unfathomable to mortals. Men might try day and night to understand them. They can't. Verse 17, man cannot find out. However much he's seeking, he will not find it out. Even the wise, that's the person who fears God, who knows God, even the wise, they cannot find it out. They cannot fathom God. See, he is debunking, isn't he, the, the nonsense, the naivety of so much shallow and superficial faith. The sort of Christianity that says, well, come to Jesus Christ, believe in Jesus, and all your problems will disappear. There'll be no more mysteries. You'll understand everything about life. That is nonsense. Verse 17 is plain. Even for the wisest Christian, there are so many things that remain an utter mystery. And that's what the New Testament teaches us plainly, isn't it? Even now, even filled with the Spirit of God, what does Paul say to the Corinthians? We still see as through a glass darkly. We're confused. We can't see everything. We know, he says, only in part. Only in part. And we need to be content to accept that. Because it's simply recognizing fundamental reality that God is God and we are not God. And so that we can't and we won't ever be able to control or understand fully the totality of things about life in this world or indeed about our own life and our own personal world. Oh, we don't like that, do we? It's the essence of sin that we will not recognize and will not submit to that simple fact. We want control. We want knowledge that's complete. We want for us things that only belong to God. That's the, the very essence of sin. Think back to Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden. It was man reaching for a God-like knowledge, for control of his destiny. And that's all wrong. And the reality is utterly different. And that's what verses 1 to 3 of chapter 9 are saying here. Look there, verse 1. It's all in the hands of a truly sovereign God. Even the very details of life of the righteous and the wise. People of faith, even as Christians, we are not exempt from the mysteries of his sovereign hand. We just do not know what lies ahead of us, do we? Whether love or hate from others, whether it's good fortune or bad. It's the same for all, verse 2. The same events happen to the righteous and the wicked, the good and the evil, the clean and the unclean, and so on. As is the good, so is the sinner. As is he who swears, so is he who shuns an oath. This is an evil, this is a mystery, an enigma under the sun. The same sort of things happen to all. We all face mixed experiences in our lives because we're all human beings. And we all inherit the same world, a world which he tells us so plainly is full of evil and madness. And we'll all, verse 5, in the end, go to the same place, won't we? We'll all go to the grave. We can't deny that, can we? And the point he's making here is you can't just look out at life and judge from what is happening in life whether God loves us or hates us, whether we're being rewarded or whether we're being punished. Because the same things so often happen to the good and the evil. God's justice is mysterious to us in this human existence. It's utterly baffling to us in this world because, why? But he is a sovereign God. And we're just creatures. And that means God is beyond us. And God will always be beyond us. Now he's not saying, don't mistake, he's not saying there's no meaning to life. He's not saying it's all random and chaotic chance. No. It's all in 
the hands of God, he says plainly in verse 1. There is meaning and order. There is design. God is directing every intimate detail. It's just that God is much, much bigger than us. His plans are beyond us. And they always will be. We will never fathom God's mysterious and sovereign justice. What does Isaiah say? For as far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, says the Lord. Friends, let me tell you, if you are not going to be a, a hardened and embittered Christian, you simply have to come to terms with that. You have to live with that. You have to learn to live humbly with the transcendence of God, with the mystery of his sovereignty. And to trust him that he is just and not unjust, even when it is a great mystery to you. That's what it really means to trust God, isn't it? That's what it means to have faith, to see the invisible, and to live with mysteries that are beyond us, things that we will never fathom in this world. If we weren't doing that, we wouldn't be trusting God at all, would we? But it's hard <laughs> When we can't understand why God allows something to happen in our lives or in somebody else's life, a loved one. When we lose the job that we love. Or we're bereaved of the loved one that we love. Or we don't have the child that we long for. Or where they have to bear some handicap in life, in our body or in our mind, something that's agonizing for us. A hundred other things that puzzle us, that grieve us to the very core of our being. It's hard. But you see, real biblical faith is not about controlling God. It's not about always understanding God and therefore manipulating God to do our bidding and what we really want. That's not faith. That's, that's idolatry. And alas, so much of what passes for Christianity today is often just that. It's a consumerist idolatry. It's an escapist fantasy. The idea that we can manipulate God to dance to our tune, to give us all the things that we want in life, if only we pray the right prayers, and to give us that insurance policy for beyond death. But that is so utterly false. And so often that is exposed, isn't it, when life's reality hits home hard with bitter disappointments, with tragedy, which isn't explained, which can't be sorted by trite religion. And that's when so many people lose their faith, isn't it? Except that it never was real faith, real biblical trust in God. Because at the heart of what is real faith is not some attempt to manipulate God's sovereignty and anger and frustration when we can't. But rather real faith is always accepting and submitting to his sovereignty, recognizing the mystery of a God who is far greater. And living humbly with the transcendence of God. Amidst the mess of our sinfulness. And for our face to shine even in the midst of the, the darkest clouds of, of his mysterious providence. That's real faith. And that, friends, is the attitude that can liberate us to live to the full under God. Even in this veil of tears. Look at verses 4 to 6. See what he's saying there is, while you're alive, there is hope. Verse 4. Knowing what, what being mortal really means is what liberates us to be most fully human. Because we know that the grave awaits. And so what he's saying is you must seize the day. Well, it is still today. That's always the Bible's message. Today. Today is the day for action. And verses 5 and 6 there, they don't mean for a minute that there's nothing beyond the grave. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. End of verse 6, they have no more share in all that's done under the sun. That doesn't mean there's, there's nothing beyond the grave. All through this book, there's been talk about God's judgment to come and life beyond that. It just means simply you've only got one life to live on this earth. Death will be a decisive end to that. There's no reincarnation. There's no second chances. That's just what the New Testament tells us in Hebrews chapter 9. It's appointed for man to live once. And then comes judgment. 
And the point is, we are given this earthly life by God for living to the full before him. For life as it really can be. Not for, not for trying to make it what it isn't, what it never can be. And you see, when you come to terms with this sovereignty of God, the mystery of his justice, his transcendence, actually it is a liberating thing for us. First of all, it frees us from anger, doesn't it? And from anxiety. If you won't come to terms with the transcendence of God, with the fact of his real sovereignty, that you can never manipulate him, that you never control him, that you can never use God to shape the world around you the way you want it to be. If you can't come to terms with that, you will very likely waste your life seeking something that you can never ever find. Because it just doesn't exist in this world. You'll be looking for a level of, of control, a level of authorship over your life that you just cannot have. Why? Because you're not God. Is that a surprise to us? For if you don't come to terms with that, you will very likely grow bitter and angry. And life will constantly disappoint you. Because these things elude you. And you'll become increasingly an angry person, not a happy person, a bitter person. And in the process, you'll miss out on so many of the wonderful things that do exist, that can be enjoyed, that can be found and rejoiced in, and that should be found and rejoiced in in these lives, even in this veil of tears, even in this world of a groaning creation. But if you accept that reality, if you embrace real biblical faith, if you trust God as God, as transcendent, as beyond your control, beyond your understanding, if you're content with what you are, a mortal, a creature, not the creator, yes, a beloved, redeemed human being, but still just a human being, not a divine being, if you accept that, then you will be liberated to rejoice and revel in all the joy in our true created humanity. You'll be freed from a life of anger. Anger about the world and anger at God often. You'll be free from a perverse view of God that you constantly think God is against you or ignoring you or being angry with you because certain things are happening in your life and not others. Just because you can't fathom what's going on. When you accept the mystery of God, that his ways are, and they always will be higher than your ways, above your understanding. When you learn to live humbly with God's sovereignty and trust him, that really is liberation. Because we stop trying to work out all the time, why? Why has God allowed this or that or the other thing to happen? Why has that lovely Christian man lost his wife so young to cancer? Why is that wonderful work of God Seem to have had it so hard as so much opposition. Why is this thorn in my flesh that I've pled to God to remove? Why has he not removed it and never will? See, the answer to so many of these questions that we ask, the answer is we don't know. And God hasn't told us. And we may never know the answer to these things. But he's asking us to trust him just the same, to humble ourselves under his mighty hand, to live humbly with his transcendent sovereignty because we know him and because we love him and because we know we can trust him. That's the only way to live, friends, that will free you from a life of anger and from a life of, of constant anxiety about the future. It's just very simply believing and taking to heart that verse we saw in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, that the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed are the things that belong to us and our children so that we might do all these words. That is such a charter of liberation when we grasp it, that God has his secrets. And they're for him, not for us, but that he has given us all the secrets that we know for the life he longs to bless us with. That frees us from anger and from anxiety. Always seeking to 
find the things that we cannot know. And it frees us for lives of action, to get on with throwing ourselves at the life that God has given us without paralyzing anxiety about the future. Again, that is such a vital thing to grasp. So many Christians are paralyzed in their lives because they're waiting and waiting and waiting for God to reveal some special thing to them about what they should do. Some Christians can't seem to take a step forward in anything, a career move, a relationship move, anything, because they have to feel sure that it's in God's will. In other words, what they want is a, a revelation of the future in advance. But that is simply to fail to live humbly with the sovereign transcendence of God. That is an unwillingness to come to terms with mystery, with the fact that there are secret things that only belong to God and not to us, and the future is one of those things. Verse 1, again, all our deeds are in the hand of God. And whether it's love or hate, whether it's good or ill, man does not know. Both lie before him. We can't know. That puts a huge spoke, doesn't it, into that kind of idea of God's guidance. You cannot know your future. God says so. Are you hearing? And nor can you try to gauge by events that happen to you whether God is showing you favor or punishment for the decisions that you have made. Because look at verse 2. The same events happen to all, the obedient and the disobedient. It's a hopeless course to seek those kind of assurances. I must be doing the right thing because God's given me this. Well, that must have been the wrong thing because that bad thing happened. That's why so many Christians get in such a knot, such a mess in this whole area of God's guidance. Don't do that. Stop. Stop trying to second guess the secret things of God. And instead, do what he tells you. Lay hold of the things that he has revealed. Get on and do them. When I'm talking to folk about guidance... I nearly always turn them to 1 Thessalonians. Don't turn there now, but listen. Here's the question. What is God's will for your life? Here's the answer. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. This is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness. In chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. There's your answer to the will of God for your life. God wants your holiness and God wants your happiness. The truly liberating happiness that only comes from a perpetually thankful heart to God. And that's just what the preacher is saying here. Submit to God's true sovereignty and it is liberating. It frees you from anger, from resentment, from anxiety and it frees you for action and rejoicing. When you truly grasp just how great God's sovereignty really is, just what it means to be inescapably in his hands, that is what liberates you to seize the day while it still is today, while you're still alive. There's only one life for living that God has given you, and then comes judgment. So live that life for him and with him, and live it with all your might. That's what the Bible teaches us. Recognize the mystery of God. Yes, he is truly sovereign over it all. And therefore, rejoice in the mandate of God that he has set you truly free to live before him with joy. And he really does. Look with me at these final verses, 7 to 10. You could call these the three R's for that holiness and happiness that is God's will for our lives. First R. He says, find joy in the refreshment that God gives you now in life. Go, eat your bread in joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Now that is a liberation from some perverse view that God's always against us. It's a liberation to rejoice in God's good gifts. And liberation from the perversity of slaving miserably through life, working so hard all the time for the future, so that the present, 
just, just passes you by and leaves you constantly miserable and exhausted and angry at life and angry at God. Stop, says the preacher. Go home and rejoice in the simple pleasure of a good meal and a glass of wine. Don't feel guilty. Look, God has already approved what you do. Does it need to be any clearer? What a great verse that is for workaholics. For people who never have any time for lunch, never any time for anything, always at work, always at their desk, always stressed out with everything, always looking and not having enough time for anything at all. No! Look, where I say, put on your white garments, put on your happy clothes. Take time to make yourself look good. Put on those cosmetics, that Yves Saint Laurent hair oil or whatever it is. God has made us to enjoy refreshment in life while we're still alive. Because it's too late in the grave for your cosmetics. The preacher is actually speaking to a society not unlike ours, probably the returned exiles. There was a great economic boom. There was a rat race. People were striving, working two or three jobs to pay their mortgages. Nothing changes under the sun. Well, he says to us, there's only one life. The dead have no more share in that. No more rewards of life on earth. So find joy in refreshment, in rest. God is the God of rest, the God of Sabbath, joy. Especially on the day of rest. Rejoice in his day of rest. If you're a student, do not spend all your Sundays studying for your exams. That's miserable. Go out and enjoy the sunshine and have a picnic with your friends. As long as you're doing some work some other time. Find joy and refreshment in life, even now, before you're dead. Second R, find joy in the relationships that God gives you in life. Now, verse 9, enjoy life with the wife you love, because that is your reward. Relationships with other people are at the very heart of what's really important in life. So make time for them, he's saying. Relish them, find joy in them. Don't sacrifice these things which are really valuable and joyful for worthless things, for things that will just pass away and mean nothing in the end. Isn't it extraordinary? Isn't it tragic when people do that? When there are people for whom their garden or their properties or their money or other things is more important to them than the relationships they have with their family, with their friends, with others. And it's really too late that they discover just how tragic it is, that they've missed that. Yes, the focus here is especially on marriage because that's the closest relationship of all. And we can fail to invest properly in that relationship. Maybe especially it's a word to men. He is speaking to men, isn't he? But I'm sure it applies to both. But it applies to all of our relationships in life with our family, with our friends, with our loved ones. They are so precious, yet often it is, isn't it, that it's only too late when we've lost them that we realize just how precious they were. You kids say to you, come and do something with me, and you're always saying, to them, no, I'm too busy, I'm too busy working, too busy doing this and that. Stop that. Go and play hide-and-seek with your kids. They won't be children for very long. Are you the kind of woman who can never get out because you're always doing one more thing in the house, one more bit of cleaning, one more bit of ironing, one more bit of something else? Leave it, live with a dirty house, live with crumpled clothes, and go out for a romantic meal with your husband. He's going to ask you this week to do just that, aren't you men? <laughs> do it! Do your friends never see you because you're constantly involved in things, spiritual things, church things? Maybe you need to read chapter 7, verse 16. It's a warning against being over-righteous. We can be over-righteous even in the service of the kingdom of God. Sometimes we need to step back and invest, find joy in the relationships with those that we love. That's your portion. That's your reward in this life. That's what God reveals he wants us to do. Do it with a merry heart. He's already approved it. Find joy in our relationships in life now, before we go to the grave. And thirdly, find joy in the responsibilities that God has given us in our life now. Verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. 
because you only have this life to do it in. See, a real grasp of God's sovereignty never, ever, ever leads to fatalism, to inaction. It is the total reverse. It liberates us for action, to work urgently. For the night is coming when no man can work, says Jesus. Just the same thing. And we want to serve our master while it is still today, while we're still alive in these bodies. So don't be paralyzed by fear, by fearfulness. Don't be waiting constantly for some special assurance of God's guidance before you ever do anything. It's not possible. Go and do it, says God, with all your might. Has God given you a place to serve him at home or at work or maybe in full-time ministry, wherever it is? Well, grasp it with both hands. Go. Do it. Has God opened a door for you? Has he given you a heart's desire to do something for him? Well, don't wait. Go and do it with all your might. God's true sovereignty doesn't constrain you. It compels you to step out in faith and trust in a God in whose hands all that you do is all of the time. All your deeds are in the hands of a sovereign God. You don't need to worry that there's something that you can do that can somehow mess up God's plans. Let me just reassure you, that cannot happen. He is a lot bigger than you. This is a transcendent God, a sovereign God. And living humbly with that reality means you don't waste time seeking the mysterious secrets that are not ours to know. That's a dead-end alley every time. No, you launch out in faith with him. You joyfully trust him all the way. So there we are, the secret things. They are for God alone, the mysterious sovereignty. Recognize the mystery. But the things revealed, they do belong to us, that we might be truly liberated for joy in life. Recognize his mystery and rejoice in his mandate. Find joy in the refreshments that he gives us in life, and there are many. And find joy in the relationships that he gives us in life. They are so precious. And find joy in the responsibilities he gives you, whatever they may be. Be freed. Freed from anger, from anxiety. And freed for action. That's the way to live this life with a joyful heart and with a shining face for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the true biblical gospel. From the preacher in Ecclesiastes, from the apostles, and from the Lord Jesus himself. Let's pray. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Go. For God has already approved what you do. Lord, help us to have faces that tell the world that we are people who are living with humble joy in the mystery of your sovereign grace and power. Help us to love and to trust you, to humble ourselves under your mighty hand, but to rejoice in all that you have called us to, in the many and the varied joys, even in this messy world. Lead us, we pray. Lead us now. And lead us in the way everlasting. And lead us to show others that way of joy now and of joy unspeakable to come. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing as we close a hymn which calls us, number 794, who love the Lord, to let our joys be known. Number 794.
heavenly fruit begun here on earthly ground. And so indeed, from faith and hope, may that grow as we live lives of shining faces and singing voices to point others to the greater joys on high. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen.